When you have the greatest money makers in history, do you think of these guys? Or maybe the classics? If you did, you'd be wrong. There are secret men and women who went after the American dream making more money than anyone else. Literally, I'm talking about counterfeiters. Counterfeiting is old as money itself. It's been called the world's second oldest profession and it's still prevalent today. You might even have a fake in your pocket right now. Before we dive into what's happening nowadays, I'm gonna take you on a wild ride through some of the craziest counterfeiters in history. Counterfeiting became insanely popular in the US for one simple reason. Years before the Revolutionary War, the British North American colonies became the first governments to print paper currency in the Western world. The reason for paper currency? Well, precious metals are hard to dig up and a hassle to lug around. Without coins, colonists had to use commodities as money. Massachusetts used corn for money for a while, Virginia used tobacco, and South Carolina rice. But then came the 1960s. This is every counterfeiter's favorite year. Massachusetts started printing bills of credit to pay its debt, and the cons became using them as money. By the time of the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress was printing paper notes called Continentals to fund the war against the British. And the chaos broke loose. Every different bank and every company had their own different notes and different credit ratings and values. By the 1850s, there were more than 10,000 different notes circulating in the US. This was the best time ever to be in the business of fake money. I mean, it was totally unregulated. Honestly, it was child's play. This madness went on for a while, like honestly longer than you'd expect. That is until the Civil War. The Fed was like, all right, enough of this nonsense. We need some uniform national currency. And eventually agencies were put in place to stop the war on fake money. Counterfeiters had nowhere to go. But what are you gonna do, make real money? Are you kidding me? But before we get into that, we need to talk about heyday. Take Mary Peck Butterworth. She was a housewife who essentially said, I'll make my own money. But before beginning a counterfeiting operation in the 1700s, all she really needed was her iron in her kitchen. Here's how it worked. Mary would cover a genuine bill with a damp cloth and then run her iron over it. This would lift the ink off the bill of the cloth, which she'd then transfer onto a blank sheet of paper. She'd finish that off by filling in the rest of the pattern by hand with her quill pens. She would then sell those fake bills for half of their face value. That's it, it would work. But it couldn't go on forever. Colonial authorities became suspicious of Mary and her husband around 1722. They stormed into her house, searching for any evidence they could make to make a conviction. Luckily, Mary's plan worked. They couldn't find any evidence. And the ingenious part about Mary's operation is that she burned the ink lost after using them. So when the authorities came to bust down her door, all they found were some iron and some burnt scraps. The court ultimately dismissed the charges for lack of evidence. Then we have the disgruntled silversmith, Owen Sullivan. This guy had some serious skills. He would counterfeit by engraving a metal plate with a real bill design. Then use a printing press to manufacture counterfeit copies. Take the New Hampshire 40 shilling note or the two British pounds. Today, copies of itself are about $400 if you're looking for a niche investment. But take a closer look at all of those curly cues and flourishes. Sullivan had to painstakingly carve every detail into a blank copper sheet mirrored. That's because the printing press needs a mirror image on a plate for the printed version to come out correctly. Sullivan became the boss of a major counterfeiting ring that started in 1749. It all started with him as an engraver. He had the hardest job of the whole operation. Next in line would be the printer, some of those printing presses who has access to the right paper and the right inks. Then at the very bottom of the counterfeiting hierarchy would be the passers, the people who would actually spend the fake bills out in public. They had the greatest risk of getting caught, but they were also much easier to replace. Keep in mind that every plate Sullivan engraved could later be used by a number of printers to manufacture fake bills. This is what helped the operation spread through almost the entire Northeast and the reason why he eventually became one of the most successful counterfeiters in the world. So as I mentioned, counterfeiters were having a grand old time up until around this time of the Civil War. Lincoln got the federal government to consolidate all these different bills into one unified currency. This was the end of the line for easy money makers. They lost their jobs and fake income. But other types of counterfeiting still flourished, including fake Confederate money. Samuel Upham was one of the Pennsylvanian shopkeeper who sold novelty items mocking the Confederacy. As a joke, he printed them with a disclaimer saying that they were fake and then sold them each for a penny. And business was 
booming. By 1862, a pen was selling over two dozen variations of the Confederate bills. However, sometimes the joke got taken a bit too far. Smugglers started taking the bills and cutting off the disclaimer before actually spending them in the South. Eventually, the Union government began worrying about Uphan's fakes might provoke the South into counterfeiting Northern money in retaliation. At first, they tried to convince him to stop, but then that didn't work. Accusing him of counterfeiting actual US money as well, which he absolutely denied. Now, luckily for him, the US Secrecy of War intervened to dismiss the case. Now, it is rumored that the War Secretary was actually supplying Upham with these high quality banknotes papers. In other words, he was deliberately helping him in an effort to destabilize the Confederate economy. And the bad news didn't stop there for the US counterfeiters, because at the end of the Civil War, a new agency was established, the Secret Service. Now, I know what you might be thinking. The end of the Civil War, Lincoln gets assassinated, presidents need more security, boom, the Secret Service is born. Wrong. The Secret Service didn't get into the protection business for another 35 years after the assassination of a different president, William McKinley, in 1901. In fact, at the time of its founding, the Secret Service had an entirely different mission, fighting counterfeiters and protecting the nation's money supply. This is the worst thing that could happen to the fake money business. You want these guys snooping around? Whether you like it or not, they still keep an eye on money supply to this day, as well as bank fraud, wire fraud, mail fraud, honestly, anything related to finance. Our next counterfeiter got some visits from the Secret Service, but this wasn't a normal case. He was a money artist named J.S.G. Boggs. Now, Boggs didn't work like Sullivan or Butterworth. He figured out how to game the system legally. See, Boggs wasn't trying to pass off the counterfeits as real. Instead, he would make drawings of banknotes so precise they could fool the naked eye. And then he would sell them as works of art for their face value of the bill. It all began at a coffee shop in Chicago when he absentmindedly drew a $1 bill on a napkin. And the waitress liked it so much that she begged him to buy it. This was the light bulb moment. He used the dollar drawing to pay for the 90 cent coffee and the waitress actually gave him 10 cents in change. Boggs was officially in the money business. He named his drawings Bog Notes and soon enough art collectors and dealers became interested in this crazy scheme. But Boggs never actually sold his bills directly on the art market. He'd spend the money on drawings and goods and services and then he would call up the collectors and tell them where they'd spent it. And then they'd have to hustle and track down whoever had the bills and attempt to purchase them. Then of course his notes would often sell for way more than face value. One of them reportedly sold for $420,000. So for Boggs it was more of a performance art aimed at getting the audience to think more critically about what money actually is. It's just an idea, trust in a system. He didn't see himself as a counterfeiter since he wasn't really trying to swindle anyone, but he still attracted the attention of the authorities. He was first arrested for counterfeiting in England in 1986, but was then acquitted. In the early 90s, his home was raided by the Secret Service multiple times, but no case was ever brought against him. Boggs continued his art career until his death in 2017, and his money drawings can be seen in major art museums, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Smithsonian, as well as the British Museum in London. Which brings us to counterfeiting today. Modern bills have a whole host of security features to combat counterfeiting. Magnetic and color shifting inks, specifically weighed paper, microprinting, and even watermarks, as well as metallic threads. But even with all that, not to mention the threat of the Secret Service, counterfeiting operations still continues to this day. And it's not just small scale operations. Advances in printing technology have led to the creation of extremely high quality counterfeiting $100 bills called super dollars. Where exactly these super dollars come from is a complete matter of debate. British criminals with over 27 million in super dollars were caught in 2002. Some even speculate that the CIA produces them to fund off book operations. But the US also believes that many of the super dollars are made by entire countries like Iran, Syria, and North Korea. So who would have better access to these printers than a country? In 2005, a North Korean chemist claimed that his country had been mass producing counterfeit US currency since the 1980s. The North Koreans would pass their bills through diplomats, crime syndicates, prominent Asian banks, and even the Irish paramilitary organizations. The Secret Service estimates that North Korea produced around 45 million in super dollars since 1989. But even with foreign governments getting in on this game, there's still rogue individuals setting up their own modern counterfeiting shops. Frank Barrasso is a Canadian man who was arrested in 2012 with $1 million in fake $20 bills. His counterfeits were so good, the police assumed that it must be the work of some large gang, not just one guy. So 
how did he do it? Whilst claiming to work for an investment company that wanted to print bond certificates, he secured this high quality printing paper from various European mills. His paper bill was the $20 bill because it was less suspicious than the 50 or 100. At the time, the design was older, so it had less security features. After five months of printing, he made 215 million US dollars in fake banknotes and would sell them at 30% of their face value. But in 2012, an undercover cop infiltrated one of his buyers and the whole operation became crashing down. Remarkably though, Frank served very little jail time. He kept the location of his printing press hidden along with a stash of 200 million in fake bills. In exchange for telling the authorities where it was, he was actually let free. He has now come full circle and currently runs a consulting business for organizations looking to avoid counterfeiters calling himself the first and foremost validated authority in the counterfeiting world today. So what does it mean for you? I see that there are two takeaways. First, it just doesn't seem worth it. I keep getting the feeling learning about this that if someone is smart enough to figure out how to make fake dollars, they're smart enough to do anything legitimate. That way you don't have to constantly look over your shoulder for the secret service. Secondly, fake money is everywhere. Billions of dollars worth. If you're a business owner, keep an eye out for these things and check your wallet right now because there is a chance that you might be carrying one around. With all that said, I think it's probably best to stick to digital payments. Anyways, take care.